great power comes great responsibility. I don't think there's any form of entertainment that Spider-Man hasn't been a part of. I never thought that I would be wearing a skin-tight suit day in and day out. Summertime means superheroes. And we've got one who plans to stick. I'm going and seeing it eight times opening day. It's physical, it's tears, it's laughter, it's fighting. With Sam directing and Toby Spider-Man and Willem as the Green Goblin, it really just brought the film up to a level that I don't think it would have been without them. Having it, girl, Kirsten Dunst doesn't hurt either. Wow. If you like action, romance. You are amazing. And eight-legged creepy crawly creatures. Then we've got you covered. Hang with us as we get caught up in the web of Spider-Mania. It promises to be one of the biggest blockbusters to swing into theaters this summer. Box office beware. Spider-Man is making his long-awaited big screen debut. Come on, move, kid! And we're going to unmask every dynamic detail behind the big budget flick, from cool effects to casting. I never read a comic, I don't think, uh, prior to being cast. Look at me. You think I'm going to read Spider-Man when I was a little girl? No. For Sam Raimi, the film's visionary director, the answer was yes. I'd been reading Spider-Man ever since I was a little kid, and um, for my 12th birthday, my folks paid a local artist uh, probably like 30 bucks to do a painting of Spider-Man, which I hung above my bed. In bringing the web wonder to the big screen, Raimi found there was plenty of action to mine from Spidey's four-decade history. Every element from the motion picture has really been drawn at some point from what has existed from the great artists and writers of uh, Marvel throughout those 40 years. Spider-Man co-creator Stan Lee has overseen Spidey's success since he literally stumbled on the concept back in 1962. I saw a fly crawling on the wall. And it occurred to me it might be kind of cool if we had a character who could stick to the wall. <laughs> then I needed a name for him. Anyway, I went down a whole list. When I got to Spider-Man, it just sounded so dramatic and a little bit scary. And lo, a legend was born. But Spider-Man was almost squashed by Lee's publisher at Marvel Comics before the character ever even made it to the drawing board. I told him about Spider-Man, what I wanted, and he said, Stan, people hate spiders. You can't call a hero Spider-Man. And he said, you certainly can't make him a teenager. He said, a teenager can only be a sidekick. Then, when I told him I also wanted him to have a lot of problems, he said, don't you know what a hero is? Heroes don't have problems, that's why they're heroes. So, um, my suggestion wasn't meant with tumultuous enthusiasm. That is, until the public got a glimpse of the web-shooting wonder, Spider-Man unofficially sprang into action in a 1962 comic book titled Amazing Fantasy number 15. When you're publishing the last issue, nobody really cares what you put in it. So just to get it out of my system, I put in the Spider-Man strip. Months later, when the sales figures came in, I'll never forget my publisher came to me and he said, hey Stan, you remember that Spider-Man character of yours, that idea that we both like so much? Why not make it a series? Now that the wall crawler has made his way into theaters, Stan Lee chalks up much of Spider-Man's hero status to the very unheroic concept that was rejected 40 years ago. He's probably the most human of the superheroes, and he was a typical teenager with all the worry, dandruff, acne, and grown toenails, you name it. You can relate to him. He's a typical high school kid. And a lot of the kids, you know, going up, you know, with their, you know, they're kind of uh, they call it awkward. And they kind of see him as a, hey, look at this guy. It's just the idea of a normal guy getting these powers, you know, completely by accident. Second generation Spider-Man artist John Romita Jr. has drawn the hero for 14 years. That word nerd is kind of used too much. But he was the everyday guy. Stan created a character that would be just the guy off the street that happens to get these powers. Spider-Man is so beloved. And like, really, I think he's just the most relatable superhero. And it's a great story and a journey as a young man going into adulthood and dealing with these powers. Peter Parker has always been an outcast. And Spider-Man, a misunderstood hero. 
And I think that's a lot of the appeal of Spider-Man, is that teenage kids understand that they think, I'm not, I'm misunderstood, just like Spider-Man is. You grow up and become an adult and you have to accept responsibility for your actions. So this is something I think is relatable that we all deal with. This movie was part of destiny. It took time for all the right people, all the stars to align to the tough project to pull off. Couldn't make the movie in the 80s. As a matter of fact, it would have been complicated in the early 90s from a technology standpoint. The biggest struggle for me was in trying to figure out how to pull off a living, breathing Spider-Man. With a great team of animators and John Dykstra by my side, I think we actually were able to pull that off. And the greatest thing in this movie was that we looked at real life, we looked at real webs, and it was very important to us to emulate the real thing, what a web will look like. It's hard to know exactly what to anticipate because there's so many special effects and there's so many elements to this film which are new to me. I think some of the things exceeded my expectations and some of them matched my expectations. When you see shots of Spider-Man web swinging over the city, I mean, even I, who am used to it, I get such a thrill out of it. It's, it, it's a visual delight. But not all of Spider-Man's magic is computer generated. Over the next hour, we'll explore the love story between Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson. Peter Parker in the beginning is just a good, ordinary, genuine kid who has a great affection for this girl since he's six years old. And he just wants to get to know her and share himself and she just has to grow out of the phase of wanting to hang out with the cool kids. Spider-Man brought out the woman in her in a way that was just like this mysterious kind of sexy mystery man who keeps saving her and that's the bad boy side I think that she's going for there. Of course every hero needs a great nemesis and later we'll catch up with Willem Dafoe better known in this film as the Green Goblin. It was a lot of fun to play, I mean, for lots of different reasons. The fact that it was a double role. And there's lots of different things that I, I get to play around Either. within the roles because there's huge action sequences, but there's also dramatic scenes and comic bits. Uh, it's got, got a lot of stuff to play with. Especially considering that the Green Goblin's alter ego is Peter Parker's mentor, Norman Osborn. Their relationship in the Peter Parker, Norman Osborn mode inform what happens in the superhero mode. It works on lots of different levels, and it's a real hybrid. It's, it's, it's part action movie, it's part popcorn movie, it's part love story. That's right, so stick around. Coming up, Spider-Girlfriend Kirsten Dunst tells it like it really is. And after the end of the day, you're sick of screaming for Spider-Man. And up next, Tobey Maguire gets all tangled up in his new role. They would end up sewing me into the suit. But first, we asked you real web users at E! Online to rank these studly superheroes. Which would you most want to be? Superman? Spider-Man? Batman? Wolverine from the X-Men? Or Spawn? Here's how they rank. At number five, it's Spawn. Number four is Wolverine from the X-Men. Batman ranked third. He was outmatched by the Man of Steel, Superman at two. And topping our superhero list is none other than web slinger, Spider-Man. Hey, it pays to be the latest movie superhero. He uh, doesn't get the girls, he's got acne. He's fairly uh, average looking kid. He's... Uh... <laughs> Both slightly better than average. <laughs> Playing the class nerd may not seem like a meaty role, but Peter Parker is no ordinary geek. If somebody told you I was just your average ordinary guy, not a care in the world, somebody lied. I think Peter, when he gets in the suit, he feels a certain confidence that he doesn't feel as Peter. He has a, a sense of humor that uh, comes out of him that, that you don't see otherwise. Jeez! I liked wearing it because when I got into the action or just the movements, it really gave me a, a, a freedom to step into that character. But landing the lead in Spider-Man wasn't that easy for Tobey Maguire. 
I had to uh, read the script and I met with Sam and talked to him about his vision for the film. And after I did those things, I was convinced that I wanted to do it. So then Sam and I had to convince the studio to hire me for the part. This is a huge movie. So the first inclination is, let's find a bankable action star. But no one cares about this guy until you get to know Peter. And Toby, he nailed the dismount. Once they um, explored with me the character of Peter Parker and who he was, they absolutely understood the choice of Tobey Maguire and got behind it 100%. Tobey Maguire took up acting at age 12. Toby then starred beside Michael Douglas in Wonder Boys. We had a lot of young actors interested in the role of Spider-Man. What we really were looking for was someone who was very real in their performance. And once I saw Tobey Maguire in Cider House Rules, I thought he was the guy for the job. I threw on a blue unitard and did a fight scene and I was in pretty good shape, so I peeled off the upper half of the unitard, tied it off of my waist, and did a topless fight scene for them. I think he's the best actor of his generation, and he was quite well known in the community, and actors, kind of an actor's actor. But it really comes down to, does it feel right to me? Do I respond to it? And just having that feeling that I really want to be a part of telling the story, and uh, that's what happened to me on this. He's very personable, has a great charisma, and I felt I could really communicate with it. You know, that inspired me, that let me think we could almost make anything happen together. Including bulking up this vegetarian leading man to superhero size. I had to eat lots of tofu. Yeah. <laughs> in prepared in very different, strange ways. Right. I trained for five months, six days a week, a combination of gymnastics, martial arts, yoga, weight training, high-end cardio stuff like cycling and running. I was working with a nutritionist. And then I got into the wire work and the actual fight choreography. He worked out five, five hours a day. Uh, he's very focused. He's an incredible young man. Then there was the task of crafting the costume. I had to go through a body cast and computer scans and a couple dozen fittings. James Atchison, our costume designer, and myself wanted to maintain the original classic look of the Spider-Man character. I wanted to show Spider-Man's eyes. I was terribly afraid of the audience disconnecting with Peter Parker when he was Spider-Man. James came up with a great Oakley lens look for Spider-Man. With Spider-Man, because the costume is so much in the lore and the fans know it, and we didn't feel that we could mess around with that. Even though we modified the costume for a movie and tried to bring it into the 21st century, it's the classic costume. The suit was pretty comfortable and flexible. The only thing that was somewhat uncomfortable is that the zippers would break, so they would end up sewing me into the suit. If I needed a drink of water or a bathroom break, it would be a little bit of a process. <laughs> Even when Peter Parker is masked by his Spider-Man persona, his very human side can't help peeking through. I think it's nice, though, in the scene in the rain when I'm talking to Kirsten. It's a, a nice moment when you see the vulnerability of Spider-Man. You see the Peter Parker in Spider-Man. At times, he misuses his power. It doesn't end up so good for him. The results are quite great. We tried to make it a positive story about a good character who learns an important lesson in his life. Just ahead, Willem Dafoe heats up the screen. Yeah, I started on fire a couple of times, but they pulled me out pretty quick. But first, we'll check in with our other web users on E-Online. We asked you guys to rank Spidey's superpowers and determine which is the coolest. The choices are web shooting, superhuman strength, wall crawling ability, Spidey sense of danger, and superhuman reflexes. The results are in, and at number five is superhuman strength. At four is superhuman reflexes. At number three is Spidey's intuitive sense of danger. At a close second are the web shooters, and coming in at number one is wall crawling ability. Whatever it is, somebody has to stop it. When news hit Hollywood that Spider-Man needed an exceptional star to don the guise of the Green Goblin, heavyweights like Nicolas Cage and John Malkovich were up for the job. But ultimately, the role of a villain hell-bent on Spidey's destruction went to the accomplished actor who wanted it the most. It's not exactly like they were breaking down my door to have me in this movie. It was something that I actually lobbied for. I got my hands on a script. I read it. I thought it was really strong. 
the role of the villain. Gavit basically functions as the villain in the movie. It was a very cool role. I talked to Sam. I liked how he talked about the movie. Rather than talking about all the effects, which I know he could deliver that stuff and the action stuff and the look of the movie. I was shooting a movie in Spain and someone came and shot some videotape of me in the vestibule of my hotel room doing a couple of Green Goblin scenes. And finally, they saw the light and cast me. In the part of the Green Goblin, we were looking for somebody that um, could handle the role physically. And the Green Goblin has to get in a lot of fights with Spider-Man. We fooled around with different fighting styles and actually did lots of different stuff, everything from kind of capoeira stuff to martial arts stuff, but ended up the goblin turned out to be pretty much a meat and potatoes kicker and puncher. That would contrast best with Spider-Man's sort of acrobatic style. Performing those stunts in the elaborate green goblin costume was another challenge. I had to learn how to deal with the costume, which was pretty extreme. James Hutchinson and myself and the production designer Neil Spisak wanted to honor the comic book, the look of the comic book. But primarily what we wanted to do was make it seem like it came from a real world. So we had to back into the logic of the Green Goblin's look and outfit. We played around with, you know, how much you should see the eyes, how much you should see the mouth, what the nature of the mask should be. The look is very strong, but also you wanted it to be expressive. And there's only so much you can do with your voice and your physical gesture. So. In some scenes, you really felt like you needed, we felt like we needed to see the eyes. The mask, maybe that was part helmet for this flying device. And he rides this goblin glider, his personal transport, kind of a, a winged rocket sled. Had to learn how to uh, ride the glider, which is, was tricky. It took great muscle coordination for an actor to stand on this thing. And you're not just sitting on this thing, though, you're riding it. Your feet are strapped to it. So not only do you have to be able to ride this thing without breaking your ankles, but um, you've got to make it seem like you're driving it. It's not driving you. Willem was able to pull that off. But also, we needed someone that um, could fulfill another aspect of the story. There's a relationship between the character Willem plays, Norman Osborn, and Peter Parker, who's Spider-Man's alter ego. What was great about Willem was we wanted someone who could play both sides, subtle, but also could have some fun with the larger-than-lifeness of, of the character. Uh, Peter, may I introduce my father, Norman Astor? I've heard so much about you. Great honor to meet you, sir. Harry tells me you're quite the science whiz. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. We wanted uh, Willem to even admire Toby over his own son, James Franco, because we felt there'd be an interesting jealousy dynamic between James Franco and Toby. I read all your research on nanotechnology, really brilliant. And you understood it? Yes, I, I wrote a paper on it. Impressive. Norman Osborn has a son. He feels greater affinity with Peter Parker than his own son, so he, he really projects a lot onto Peter Parker and identifies with him and loves him like a son, almost at the expense of rejecting his own son. Mm -hmm. So that's all in play. And then in the superhuman mode, there are echoes of that. Norman Osborn becomes sort of a surrogate father figure to Peter, and we needed somebody that had a particular warmth to them and an intelligence. Risks are part of laboratory science. Look, let me reschedule with a proper medical staff and a volunteer. I mean, if you just give me two weeks. Two weeks? Two weeks, we'll have lost the contract request and Oscorp will be dead. Sometimes you gotta do things yourself. He's a guy that works at this uh, corporation that uh, has a lot of defense contracts and the defense contract is gonna be pulled if he doesn't get results, but in order for him to get the results they need, he has to do a human test. And all the scientists say, no, no, it's too dangerous. And he says, well, he's afraid to lose the contract, so he does the test on himself. Things don't go so well. <laughs> and he's transformed to the goblin. It's basically like uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde's in. I mean, it's, it's two parts of a person, sort of, sort of the dark side and the not so dark side fighting for his soul. We knew we didn't want to do it with any fancy camera stuff. The biggest challenge was to be able to distinguish between the two voices, not make them slide into each other, make them distinct. You killed them. 
We killed them! We? The accident in your laboratory. The performance enhancers. But also have it be um, plausible that they would be coming from the same person. We killed them, Norman. We? Your accident in the lab. That directly parallels Peter Parker's transformation. Peter Parker has an accident. He's bit by a spider and he becomes Spider-Man. There's very close parallels. Once the Green Goblin finds out that his arch nemesis, Spider-Man, is none other than the boy that he's given everything to, even at the expense of his own son's love, he feels terribly betrayed. How strange. There's nobody here. Bit of a slob, isn't he? All brilliant men are. By night, uh, the Green Goblin battles Spider-Man. So little do these people realize that although he's his surrogate son, they fight to the death by night. Foe stuck to his guns when it came to doing his own stunts. Personally, I like doing that stuff. It's, it's fun to do, it's challenging, and it's all part of it. It's as important as the dramatic scenes. And, and I don't know, if you don't do those scenes, I don't know how to go to the next step in the character. Three, two, one, go. The movement of the goblin is so important. It was important to have it be very specific to me, and I didn't want to get to get generalized. He's such a strong actor. Uh, I had no idea what to expect because I can't see his personality in his roles because he's just very chameleon-like. One of the traits I found interesting is you couldn't keep this guy in his trailer if you tried. He was like always hovering on set just wanting to get in there and work. Coming up, Kirsten connects with co-star Tobey Maguire, both on screen and off. It just worked between us and I felt it too. But not before we go back to the real way. We asked the online users which of these villains is the coolest. Spider-Man's gruesome green goblin, the sadistic clown from Spawn, that pain in Superman's neck, Lex Luthor, the Riddler from Batman, or is it that sexy Catwoman from Batman? At number five, it's the clown from Spawn. Riddle me this, Batman's the Riddler is number four. At number three, it's Superman nemesis Lex Luthor. The second place villain is the seductive Catwoman. And your choice for coolest bad guy is, you guessed it, Spider-Man's own Green Goblin. He saved my life twice, and I've never even seen his face. Bringing Spider-Man to the silver screen meant delivering large doses of action and special effects. But even more important was finding the right woman to play Spidey sweetheart. Look at me, you think I'm gonna read Spider-Man when I was a little girl? No. Good thing director Sam Raimi didn't hold that against Kirsten Dunst. The first shoot date was coming up quickly. And although we had seen a lot of great actresses who wanted the part, we needed somebody that really had what they call chemistry with Toby. I was in Berlin doing the Cat's Meow at the time, and I had met Sam Raimi two months before they came to see me. I had strep throat. They wanted me to get on the plane and go to Berlin and be there for like, I don't know what it was, like 17 hours. And it sounded like it wasn't going to be fun. I guess they just weren't finding somebody who clicked with Toby in the right way. There was a little note from Kirsten thanking me for uh, coming out there knowing that I was under the weather and I thought that was very thoughtful of her and I was really struck by it. When I saw Toby step into the room, the pallor seemed to leave him, he seemed energized and there was actually an electricity that was going on between the two of them and we got it on film. Reflexes. It just worked between us and I felt it too. I think we all knew pretty much at that point that she was our girl. Never mind that the 20 year old New Jersey native started acting in TV commercials at age three and that by 12 she delivered her breakthrough performance and first on screen kiss with Brad Pitt in an interview with a vampire. 
By 2000, Kirsten was in big demand with roles in The Virgin Suicide and Bring It On before she was courted for Spider-Man. It's a great story, plots, and, and that's what really holds the film together. If you, you don't have an emotional center, then you don't draw the people in the audience in. Don't make me look ugly. <laughs> that's impossible. Kirsten put her own spin on the Mary Jane character. I definitely didn't want her to be just a damsel in distress, you know, it's definitely Spider-Man needs to save her a bunch, but, you know, I talked to Sam and I was like, you know, she needs to kick a little butt and defend herself for a little bit. You are amazing. Mary Jane kind of goes on this journey by herself, because she comes from a, a very hard home life, and she kind of covers it all up, and Peter's really the only man that she's shown a vulnerable side to, and it's been out, and he's accepted her for what she is. You're laughing at me. Oh, I, I understand. <laughs> He is extremely cool. I think she realizes at the end that she can't be dating the bad boys anymore. She has to go for the, you know, lovely guy who'll always be there for her and who's smart and sweet and makes her laugh. But do you think it's true, all the terrible things they say about him? No, no. Not Spider-Man, not a chance in the world. I think he anticipates them having a connection, but she just has to grow out of the phase of wanting to hang out with the cool kids or, or whatever. At the heart of Stanley and Steve Ditko's creation, Spider-Man, there's always been a very strong romantic thread that I've been attracted to. Do I get to say thank you this time? It's actually kind of sad because he has such a responsibility as Spider-Man that, that he can't really let her in too close because, you know, otherwise she'll be in danger. Still, Carol is par for the course for Mary Jane, and Kirsten even performed more of her own stunts than co-star Tobey Maguire, since her character lacked the luxury of wearing a mask. It was a little scary. They hooked me up to wire, because at one point the balcony, it breaks off the balcony, and then it breaks off like that. <laughs> Sam would be like, look over here, and then, ah, he's coming back. And after the end of the day, you're sick of screaming for Spider-Man. You really did well. This is you're so dynamite. <laughs> it looks great on the film, though. Okay. Even though you knew certain shots were CGI, it just looked like a comic book page was jumping off the screen. For such a big movie, we were very unorganized sometimes. Like, we'd be rewriting scenes sometimes that, that day. Who are you? To have a cast like that in Spider-Man, it's like, it just raises it to such a great level. I think that with Sam directing and Toby Spider-Man and Willem as the Green Goblin, it really just brought the film up to a level that I don't think it would have been without them. Up next, director Sam Raimi unmasks the secrets of Spider-Man. Just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it can't be done. But first, let's get caught in the World Wide Web. We asked the online users to rank their favorite superhero love interests. Here are the choices. Spider-Man's Mary Jane Watson, Batman's woman Vicki Vale, the woman who made Superman weak in the knees, Lois Lane, Betty Banner who tamed the Hulk, or Spawn's lady love, Wanda Fitzgerald. Kicking off our list at number five is Wanda Fitzgerald from Spawn. Your fourth place favorite female is the Incredible Hulk's Betty Banner. Third among our lady love interests is Batman's Vicki Vale. Superman's Lois Lane got your pulse racing at number two, and pulling rank at number one is Spider-Man's Mary Jane. In Hollywood, no blockbuster comes to life overnight. Spider-Man had been in search of the right director for years, producer Avi Arad. Walked into the room and I saw just there was goodness in his face. There was something in there that said, I trust this guy. That was one. Two, in his childhood, his parents actually as a gift painted Spider-Man behind his bed. So I knew he had that commitment to the character. All right, let's see a rehearsal. Practicing. Sam was a big Spider-Man fan from the time he was a child, and I think had a kind of passion about the project. Um, they knew he was a you know, more than capable filmmaker who had a kind of unique style. He's kind of has this wonderful sly humor, which seemed to fit, and he had this kind of connection or relationship to the character and it was something that he had loved all his life. So I think that's what got him the job to tell you the truth. Background! Background, both camera and action. Cut. Cut, 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 cut. 
Oh yeah, I was terrified going into making Spider-Man. Action. I never thought that I would get hired for the job. Great. Looks good. Let's get one more. Get one more. That's a print. Yeah, we had a good time on the film. It was, but it was a very like, you know, a lot of opinions, a lot of pressure, a lot of studio heads coming in, this and that. I mean. They definitely left Sam alone, you know, a good portion of the time, but then there'd just be a line of people at the monitor waiting for him to prove stuff. With the pressure that Sam had, he really handed, handled it so gracefully, and I never heard it, him raise his voice once. I just thought Sony Pictures would hire somebody with uh, more of a track record for this type of uh, bigger picture behind them. Hey. So when I got the job, I, I was terrified. I mean, how, how was I going to make these extraordinary movements of Spider-Man with all his grace and agility swinging through the canyons of Manhattan be as good as all the fans knew they should be. Raimi thought wrong. With Sam at the helm, the actors came on board. I knew Sam Raimi was attached, which really helped it define what kind of movie it was going to be for me. He's very inspiring to work for. He really loves Spider-Man with such a passion, and, and he just, his eyes twinkle when he speaks about Spider-Man, like a little boy. Sam Raimi, the director, runs a pretty fun set and really encourages the actors to personalize stuff and bring stuff to the role and invent stuff. So people are always inventing things and surprising you. Good. Okay, that's clean. Okay. Yeah always had time to deal with everything and he was very uh, encouraging for me to contribute my ideas. He made me really feel like a collaborator and a partner of his through the process of making this film. When it came to creating a comic book world on screen, Raimi enlisted the help of some other partners. I was fortunate that I have uh, met up with John Dykstra, our visual effects designer, and he really is a genius. He said to me, just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it can't be done. Yeah, and I hate when the other guy gets the good line. But every element from the motion picture has really been drawn at some point from what has existed from the great artists and writers of, of Marvel throughout those 40 years. Filmmakers now have grown up with that comic book as a child. And they really want to make these comic books. Because um, what better material for a director than a character that he knows so intimately and loves? It's really... Um, perfect for somebody to direct. The main focus for this director was staying true to the original comic book principles. So now I think we just It's a story of a young boy who is slightly irresponsible and how he learns to become a slightly responsible young man. So it's a coming of age story, but we tried to make it a positive story about a good character who learns an important lesson in his life. I want to fight you, Flash. I wouldn't want to fight you either. Raimi thinks in the end, Spider-Man fans and curious moviegoers worldwide will be pleased. I hope they feel exhilarated and uplifted. And um, like any story of a hero, I hope it shows us in some small way uh, of the good that we're capable of. Sure, this movie is about action, romance, and life lessons, but what would Spider-Man be without, well, spiders? And in the case of this movie, real spiders. I'm an entomological consultant and an arachnologist, which means is, um, which means in common terms, I'm a bug wrangler and I solve bug problems for the movie industry. I brought in some tiny spiders and that's what Sam wanted and I demonstrated how to make spiders go up and down and different things I could do and they liked what I could do and they realized that I was the right person. Stephen Kutcher's specialty is spiders. Spiders of almost any breed. On the film, Kutcher was called on to direct the arachnids for the scene where Peter Parker encounters the genetically engineered spider. We used four spiders in Spider-Man. Cucucamia, Agilinity, Delena. Genes from those three spiders were taken to make a mutant spider, which was played by Steatota. And Steatota is the spider that webs down and bites him. And that spider has uh, very unique characteristics and they were apparently transferred to Peter and Peter became this incredible superhero. So I had to create that whole scenario. Kutcher's eight-legged actors even won over their two-legged counterparts. People on the set really loved my spiders because they were interested in it. They'd come over and look and see what the spiders were doing. And so um, 
that was kind of fun. And then I got to demonstrate different things I can do with spiders and, and answer questions about spiders. Ironically, the cast member who seemed the most uncomfortable with Kutcher's creatures was Spider-Man himself, Tobey Maguire. Well, he was questioning it a little bit because all of a sudden he's going to have this spider web down on him. But he, he handled it as a professional. He, he really did a good job. And once he got into it, then it was, the issue wasn't the spider anymore. The issue was, let's get a really good shot. Special effects were no match for the real thing. I was hoping that, that they would, would use real spiders because real spiders do what real spiders do. They could have easily computer generated it, but it, they could have, it could have easily not looked good either. Spiders aren't the only creatures who crawl at Kutcher's command. I got started in the film industry because my major professor had a, got a call for someone to take care of 10,000 African locusts. And it ended up being 3,000 African locusts, and the person to take care of them ended up being me. And I worked on The Exorcist II for, six, for six, over a six-month period, and that was my first start. Yeah. And then pretty soon other people were calling because they realized that I was really good with a specialty of working with insects and spiders. Casting the right arachnid can be as tough as finding the right actors. I know people who raise spiders, and uh, we had some spiders shipped in from New Zealand. Between films, this spider wrangler keeps his prized specimens in tip-top form with a strict regimen of exercise and web spinning. What I'm going to demonstrate is how spiders can climb up something slippery like this plexiglass, which is really slippery. And so what I have is a pink-toed tarantula. So you can try this at home. Spider-Man is just a great character. I mean, I can think of superheroes that wouldn't be quite as good, like Slugman, would not make it very well. And the colors, red and blue, I mean, if they added white, what, what, what more American can a superhero be? While Kutcher delights in a superhero based on his beloved creatures, Spider-Man creator Stan Lee has his own arachnid appreciation. <laughs> it's a funny thing. I have no particular feeling about spiders one way or another. But I will tell you one thing. Whenever my wife or I see a spider in our house, not too often, thank goodness, I take the, the cap off a uh, can of anything, and if the spider is crawling on the wall, I put the cap over it, put an index card under it, and then I carry it outside and take the card away and let the spider go into the bushes. I cannot kill a spider. As Spider-Man hits theaters, the filmmakers are already looking to this superhero to provide some super sequels. One of the nice things about uh, our ongoing soap opera, something like Spider-Man obviously will have sequels. I am signed on for second and third, yeah. I'm excited about it. I, I'm looking forward to seeing where the character goes. Yes. I mean, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing one, or if they do, that I'll be in it. But if they choose, so I, I'm in it. Oh, yes, they already have it planned. So, yes, I'm sure there will be sequels. Thank you so much. The second script is starting to be written, but I haven't had a chance to work on it yet. The sequel, which they're working on now, and then the following sequels, they will all have visuals that'll be breathtaking. I think Sony, to their credit, believes in our movie. It just makes sense to try to put the team back together and make another one. You won't see Doc Ock in this, but you will see a cameo of one other villain at least, maybe two. We're just starting to write the script. One of the hardest things, I think, with 40 years of comic books is to know what part of the story to tell. The trick with the character, because it's been done so long, and now they got a movie coming out, and probably two or three more, is to make it topical. Sam and I are always discussing where we want Mary Jane to go or what should be happening. I'm always like thinking of things that I'd like maybe to happen in the script. And to be able to work with Sam again is so wonderful because he was just a dream to work with. For now, filmmakers have high hopes that audiences will definitely catch the Spider-Man bug. As far as like people's expectations, I'm not too concerned. I put all that responsibility onto Sam. They don't want to reveal too much. They don't want to spoil spoil it for the kids that want them to be swept up into the thing. It's a movie that you just like go and it just sucks you up, I think. Right from the beginning credits, I think the movie just takes you right in. And it's just like so entertaining, the whole movie. It's just like one great ride. We're trying to make the picture appeal to an intelligent audience so that adults can really enjoy it. But at its heart, it'll have a lot of fun and excitement and adventure that the kids will also enjoy. I hope it's huge. 
I hope people really like it. I hope they were entertained, uh, and then whatever else they get from it. When I see a film, I like to be entertained, possibly educated. You'll have to see the movie and figure out what's coming next. This is my gift. It is my curse. You do too much. You're not Superman, you know.